Well, good evening. Did you guys enjoy the food? I did. Hey, let's give a round of applause to the uh, hospitality people. All right. Well, love is the most excellent way. If you guys would go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. And while you're flipping there, I want to talk a little bit about what is love. And if you say, baby, don't hurt me, don't hurt me no more, I'm going to be really upset with you. <laughs> but really, what is love? Where does it come from? Have you ever meditated on this? Is it just like a chemical response in our brain? Or is it a pure emotion that we have? Does it come within us? Or is it outside of us? You know, we see love in our culture through music, poetry, media, and books. And a ton of songs sing about love. In fact, it's the number one topic that uh, people sing about, sing about love. And then we see it demonstrated in our personal lives, our relationships with one another, or we watch other people show each other love. So we all have a good idea of what love is. Those of you who have children know that, you know, that, that moment that you find out that you're pregnant, it's like instantaneous love. And then when the baby comes along and then you get to meet that baby, wow, then you really have just an immense love for that child. So I believe that every human being has experienced some level of love. You know, we live in an age of grace where God's love is really covering the planet, for lack of better terms. You know, because of this age of grace that we're under, we all get to benefit and experience love. So if you think about, you know, maybe even the darkest, most prolific sinner, do they not love their children? Do they not love their wives? They do. Now, it might be a little bit, or it might be uh, perverted love, but they love. And so we're kind of all under God's umbrella of, of the, just a general idea of what love is that we get to experience. So rather, you know, you're a person who just loves everybody and, you know, you grew up just receiving love you were shown a lot of love and you love to nurture people and give it away. Or if you're somebody that, you know, maybe you grew up and love wasn't in your house. Maybe you don't really know what real love is or what um, you didn't really experience it yourself. But either way, we, 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 we all know what love is. Now, it's kind of funny, too, because different languages express it differently. I know you guys have all heard, especially being in a Bible teaching church, that we talk about the four loves that we read in the Greek, different words for love. So Greek has four different words. English, we only have one word for love. So in, in our language, we try to express love with one word, but using it for different levels of love. And what I really find interesting is the Hebrew. The Hebrew only has one word for love as well. However, it has two meanings. So one of the meanings for the word is love, just as we would expect it to be. But the other meaning is I give. So I give. And that's a beautiful picture of what love is. I give. And I, I just love how they use the same word for those two terms. I wanted to share uh, a quick story with you. 
we saw this unfold this weekend. Um, I had the privilege of teaching in John Day, Oregon on Sunday, and one of the, the women that we had a contact with invited us to come up, our family, and stay the night. She had an apartment on her property. She was going put, to put us up in there. And, you know, this, this woman didn't have money. You know, she's going through a divorce. She has four kids. And yet she wants to take on our family and put us up. And she fed us dinner Saturday night. You know, this, she has this kind of love I give. And, and she was just constantly giving. But what really touched me and Jacqueline in our hearts was Sunday night after church, uh, she invited us back over again, and we went over for a meal. And as we're sitting around the table, she had invited all these people to the meal. You know, there, there was someone there that was uh, borderline mentally retarded, and there was somebody who had a disease who was, you know, very, very frail, very weak and skinny. And then there was a couple ladies who were also poor, that uh, helped prepare the meal the night before. There was a foreigner. There was a lady from Sweden that she let pull onto her property in her van and live on the property while she's trying to reach out to her son. And we're just sitting there blown away at this example of love because that's, that's what it's about, is loving people and loving the downtrodden. And, it, and the Lord said to me, he was like, can you love people like this? And, and I was just really touched by that because I was like, yes, Lord, I can love people like this. But, but it was also a little convicting because I wasn't the one that invited those people. She was. But it was a great example of what love is and what it, love can be. Okay, well, let's pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 13. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Well, these two verses really impacted me a few years ago. This, these verses were kind of an aha moment for me, where I remember reading them and just being like, wow, that's right. You can't, you can't do it without love. You know, we can, we can have all the faith in the world, we, we can do all the works in the world, but if we don't have love, I'm nothing. And so a few Wednesdays ago, Pastor Troy taught on spiritual gifts. In fact, it was the chapter right before this. One of the chapters he taught out of was uh, 1 Corinthians 12. And this, this is following the same thought of that, that Paul is going through the teaching of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But now we get here, and now he's teaching about love. So here we see that love is greater than the spiritual gifts. Or you could say, love is the greatest spiritual gift. So in verse 3, he goes on. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So here we see that love is greater than works. You know, in the book of James, James said that faith without works is dead. But works without love is dead. You see, love is sacrificial. But a sacrifice can be made without love. We see this a lot in the Old Testament. People doing sacrifices with the wrong heart, with the wrong motivation. In fact, God even spoke through the, the prophet Hosea saying, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So sacrifice is empty without love. 
It's pointless and meaningless. And the prophet Jonah is a great example of this. You know, after he was disobedient, you know, God called him to go uh, share with Nineveh that they must repent. And what did Jonah do? He ran. (laughs) He ran the opposite direction. And we know from the story that he got dumped overboard in a storm and swallowed by a fish, and he was in the fish for three days. And after the three days, he was spit out on the shore. So then Jonah was willing to be obedient, right? So Jonah went to Nineveh, and he preached that they must repent, and they did. The king was on board. The subjects were on board. They all sat in sackcloth and ashes and repented. But you know what? Jonah was depressed. Jonah hated the Ninevites. And so in verse 3, it says that it profits me nothing. And that's really what Jonah was experiencing in that moment. See, God did this miraculous work to uh, bringing this sinful city to repentance. And all Jonah wanted to do was to sulk. He had no love in it, and it profited him nothing. See, Jonah was willing to sacrifice, but he didn't do it with love. So now in verse 4, we get into what love is and what love is not. So I'll read verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself is not puffed up. Well, love suffers long. Now, that doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? You know, long-suffering is the ultimate patience. And normally, we look at patience as a bad thing. Why is that? I mean, how many of you have heard the saying, never pray for patience, right? We hear that all the time. Well, that's hogwash. You don't want that. I mean, don't you want that aspect of love in your life? It says right here that long, love suffers long. And so we want patience. We want to be patient. It's, it's not something that we should avoid. Now, you know, I, I get it. I get that, you know, uh, pa- being patient, is you suffer, right? Because you have to wait. It's not in your time. Uh, there's anguish and stress that comes along with it. So I get that aspect of it. But it is de- love is defined this way. Now, in the second part of that, it says that it is kind, So, what I, what, the idea that came to my mind when I was preparing for this, I thought about a wayward child. We talk to a lot of people in the church who have children who are non-believing or they've fallen away from the faith. And these parents of these kids suffer long. Some of them for years, they pray for them for years and years and years before they come back to the faith. But see, that's what love is. Love, you you suffer long because you love them. I also think about uh, the example of an unbelieving spouse. We, We hear this a lot in the church as well, too, where one of the spouses come to church, the other one doesn't, or they don't believe. And so that person will pray for their spouse and... And it might even be more difficult because they live with them, right? So they might have to put up with behavior. You know, they, they might have to put up with unli- unloving things that that person is saying to them. And so love gives us the power to do that, to be long-suffering. Now, when we start to be unkind, that's usually when our patience runs out. So consider this verse. It's in 1 Peter 4, 8. 
And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. So I like what Peter says there. Be fervent in your love. And so why, why does love cover the sin? Does that mean that we just turn a blind eye? We just let them continue sinning? Of course not. That, that doesn't make sense. But it brings us to forgiveness. That fervent love will also allow us to be long-suffering with their unbelief. And the whole goal here is for us to be more Christ-like. And I love what the following verse says. It's Psalm 145, 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. And so that's the idea for us, that we would be like that. We would be like Christ. We'd be slow to anger with them. We'd be kind with them as we suffer long. Well, the second part of that verse talks about uh, love does not envy. It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. So you see, love is not prideful. I think that's a really clear reading of the scripture. It's very straightforward. But one thing I want to point out in this section of scripture is that about these qualities is that what did Lucifer do? We read about Lucifer in Isaiah 14. Lucifer was envious of God. He paraded himself. He said that he would ascend as high as God in the heavens. And obviously his pride was his fall. And the Bible says that pride goes before a fall. So this is a good caution for us. You know, if, if we're being prideful, that's not in love. We're setting ourselves up for a fall. And hey, if pride brought down an angel, it can surely bring down you too. All right, in verse 5. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. I really like the does not statements here because I think sometimes it's easier if we hear love doesn't do that to convict us of the things that we might be doing wrong. And I think these two verses also are very applicable to marriage or any other relationship, really. But I see the first two traits as offenses. So do not behave rudely, and love does not seek its own. These are actions toward the other, pers- the other person. And the second two I see more as defensive. What I mean by that is that they're, they're more there. It's a loving thing to not fall into the trap of maybe a fight or to not fall into the trap of easily being offended. And, you know, our society screams offense. It seems like everybody is offended and hurting. Well, I believe it's because they have not received love and they're not giving love. Uh, The other thing that uh, jumps out to me when we talk about, you know, not to rejoice in iniquity. I, I can't help but think of our political system, you know, political parties that we we start to divide, you know, we've got the Republicans over here and the Democrats over here, or maybe it could even be a division of believers. You know, we've got Christians here, and then we've got atheists, agnostics, and false religion over here, however you want to divide it. 
But um, if that other side really blows it, we shouldn't rejoice in that. That is not a loving thing to do. So the other group that's opposed to the group that you might belong to, you know, let, let's just say that they do something really horrific. You know, that, that's not a time for us to rejoice. You know, it grieves the Lord when we do something wrong. And so we shouldn't rejoice in that either. And so I just want to be honest with you that that's not a loving thing to do. And I know this is really hard in the political realm. You know, we really want to throw darts at the other party. You know, we, we really want to say, I told you so, or, you know, just, just really be cold-hearted. So I just want you to check your heart in those things. You know, I, I know it convicted me uh, personally. Well, verse 7. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So here we have bearing and enduring, sandwiching belief and hope. You know, often it's so easy for us to think of love as just this fluffy emotion. But love transcends emotion. Because faith and love and hope help, helps us to conquer those things that are difficult in life. Love sticks it out. And I can't help but think of wedding vows here. You know, just to share a couple with you. In sickness and in health, for richer or poorer. But see, there's like this, there's this uh, battle of duality in our lives where it's easy in the happy times, but when the sad times or the tough times come, we want to run, we want to flee. But that's not love, because see, love has the strength to stick it out. And look at the next verse. This is why. Verse 8. Love never fails. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Love never fails. It really doesn't. The only thing that fails is the lack of love. Love isn't the problem, it's us. You know, last week, Paul alluded to this a little bit, that, you know, we can have all the head knowledge. You know, we can, we can sit and study all these worldviews and try to figure out the faith. But if we don't have love... It's all for naught. It's just a bunch of head knowledge. And as we see there, the end of that verse, knowledge will vanish away. So it's vanity to chase that stuff. Tongues will cease, prophecies will cease, and knowledge will pass away, but love endures forever. And this really, you guys, is what the whole chapter is building up to. We're, we're coming to the main point here. And so in verse, if you would skip down to verse 13. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So maybe, maybe you've kind of been snoozing so far and snoozing through the definitions of love. But if you could just wake up for a moment. This is why love is the most excellent way. You know, obviously faith is huge. We can't come to the kingdom of God without faith. So we got to have faith. But isn't God's kingdom a kingdom of love? And faith and believe give way to love. 
You see, love is an action word, and it's really where our faith meets the road. Do you guys remember the song? They will know we are Christians by our love. I love that old, that old song. And it's true. Christians are called to be lovers of God and lovers of people. And I, I know that Jesus said it best. And so keep a thumb where we're at. Uh, we're going to bounce back to Matthew 22. Matthew 22 and go down to verse 36. Matthew 20, 22, 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You see, if love was not the most excellent way, Jesus wouldn't have said that. He wouldn't have said that the, the law and the prophets hang on love. So love is greater than the law. So maybe you're sitting here tonight and you're thinking, well, I want to love more, but it's difficult. Or maybe every time that you try to show love to somebody, they spit in your face. They stomp on you. They walk on you. Or maybe you just acknowledge to yourself that you don't have a lot of love in your heart. Well, listen, you can't give away what you haven't received. So if you're feeling that lack of love in your life, you need to go back to step one. You need to acknowledge the severity of your sin, your own sin. If you guys remember the story of the sinful woman, the prostitute who came and anointed Jesus' feet, you know, she had her oil. She was crying at his feet, anointing it with oil and the tears running down, and she took her hair and cleaned his feet. You know, the Pharisees were watching this happen, and they were like, if he was a prophet, he would know what kind of sinful woman was touching him. And I just love Jesus' reply, because he says, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. So those who have been forgiven much, love much. So what we need to realize is that our sins, even if they're few, are just as deplorable to God as this prostitute's sins. And so if you have accepted Christ into your life and you've been forgiven for these serious sins, against God? Should you not love like she loves? Should you not be overwhelmed with thankfulness that just drives you to love and follow after God? We should be. Consider this verse in Romans 5 eight. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God is the one that initiates love. So in the beginning when we ask, is love within us or is it exterior to us? I would have to pick exterior to us because we love because he first loved us. And if you are lacking love in your life, it's because you are lacking Christ. And what I mean by that is you're either not a believer, you don't truly believe, or you have not experienced enough 
of God's love in your life. You know, Romans also says that the wages of sin is death. So listen to me, this is important. If you have been forgiven of a death sentence, you should be a lover. You should be a lover of God. You should be a lover of people. And so tonight I've been mostly speaking to believers. But this is also applicable to you if you are not a believer. And I want to talk to you for a minute. As I pointed out, you have this death sentence hanging over your head. You've lived a life of unrighteousness before a holy God, a holy and righteous God. And you've not received his love. But I want to encourage you that there is forgiveness for sin. You know, John 3.16 says it beautifully. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved. God so loved. See, God doesn't want you to perish. He loves you and he desires that all would come to repentance. So what you need to do is to respond to that love. You need to believe. I was moved by that song we were singing today. You know, I believe. It's the creed song. I believe in the Father. I believe in the Son. You need to believe. You need to believe in all of it. You need to believe that you're a sinner and that you're separated from God. You need to believe that you need a Savior and you need to believe that Christ is who he says he is. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the Messiah. And he's the one that takes our sin away. He's the ultimate sacrifice. So if you believe that to be true in your heart, like you genuinely believe that, you will be saved. And then you will start receiving the love of God in your life. God already loves you, but now as you become a born-again child of God, you will experience, experience that love in a different way than you ever have in the past. And as you receive the love of Christ into your heart, you will also be empowered to then turn around and love people. To love people like you've never been able to love people before. So I want to close with this. With one question. How are you doing on the love scale? I also want to invite the band back up. We're going to spend some time in prayer, um, especially, you know, if, if you're a non-believer and, and you are moved to accept the Lord as your Savior. I just want to pray for you. And for the rest of us, you know, I want to pray for us as a whole that we would just be loving people. That we would abide in God's love. And it says, Jesus says in the book of John that we need to abide in his love. And that's that we dwell with him. We dwell within his love. That his love is surrounding us. That this is an every, everyday occurrence. This is what life is. This is what the Christian life is. And so as a, Christ, a growing Christian, you need to know this. So let's pray. Well, Father, God, we just lift up to you, Lord, anybody that is moved just to accept you as their Lord and Savior, Lord. And I just pray, God, that just between you and them, Lord, that they would accept you and that they would believe, God, 
truly believe that they would put aside their fears, they would put aside their burdens, their hang-ups, their doubts. God, I pray you'd reach their heart. And Lord, for the rest of us, I just pray, God, that we would be loving people, Lord. You know, not that we want to go back and dredge up our, own, our old sins. It's not about that. But that we would be so thankful that you saved us from the pit of hell. God, that we would just have a burning love and a burning desire for you, God. And that we would ab abide with you forever, Lord. We would bask in your love. Lord, and I pray you would change us through your love, Lord. Make us more effective through the kingdom, for the kingdom. Lord, I pray that people would know that we are Christians by our love. Pray that we would be living this out expressively and that you would be the one who has brought all the glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.